Doctor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for organizers and thank you, Your Excellency Dr. Tudor and Namda Sattar for the great introduction. Uh, as we discussed earlier, and I think we had some very good discussions so far to set the groundwork, especially the, the recent one by uh, Frank Wouters, uh, as we can see, hydrogen is, is a hot topic. It's one of those rare topics that's not only hot in energy research, as well as technology investment, but also policy development. And I think that it's a tribute to its flexibility and its um, uh, ability to address many different sectors at the same time. It's not the first time hydrogen, however, has been hot uh, or in the news. There was a, a period in the 70s where there was oil price shock, but then uh, and an interest in air pollution, but then the hydrogen interest went back down uh, as oil prices uh, again uh, dipped. And then 90s, similar, increased environmental awareness, uh, raised potential benefits to hydrogen, but again, uh, too low oil prices discouraged projects. But recently in 2000s and, and then in the last couple of years uh, with climate change and with focus on decarbonization and improvements to technology, it's a different uh, situation. And, and I think as we can see from the speakers and from all the recent uh, project, uh, projects announcements that hydrogen is probably here to stay. Um, it's, uh, as the IRENA calls it, most likely the missing link in the energy transition. So um, taking that into consideration, my topic is a bit more focused. Um, obviously, uh, hydrogen is such a wide topic. We can, and in this, in this discussion today, we'll, we'll address many different parts, but my specific focus will be looking at, uh, at it from LNG and what, what impact uh, will the hydrogen uh, development have on LNG, liquefied natural gas, and natural gas in general. Uh, and then try to understand where those two intersect and if there's any uh, any uh, insights to, to to consider. So let me just share my presentation. And this should be on the screen now. Yes, we can see it if if you if you go full mode, yeah. Yeah. Is that fine? Yeah, now it's fine. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, the LNG, LNG role in the hydrogen economy. So hydrogen, as I mentioned, is gaining prominence as a key tool to combat climate change. Uh, why are we talking about LNG? Because within fossil fuel, is, it is the fastest growing fossil fuel. And even in, uh, in net zero or I would say Paris compliant uh, scenarios, LNG is still forecasted to grow uh, in at least 10 to 15, 20 years, even conservatively. And despite COVID and despite uh, there are still quite a few uh, projects being announced as, as, as this continues. Currently, the main option to hydrogen production to meet hydrogen uh, demand is uh, via natural gas, but as we heard from previous speaker that that's changing. Going forward, the main options to meet low carbon high demand will be through natural gas combined with CCS or renewable energy sourced uh, green hydrogen uh, using electrolysis as, as we just heard. In a decarbonizing world, however, uh, long-term LNG could feature in the gas-fired power generation using CCS or as potential future hydrogen supply. And we'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, as hydrogen pathways develop, uh, LNG could maybe possibly become a more cost-effective and CO2-effective way uh, to meet hydrogen demand, subject to many uh, different uh, considerations. But it's something to consider. Natural gas with hydrogen will have to compete, obviously, with green hydrogen long term, and we'll, we'll, we'll dissect what that means. So this is a, just a summary of looking at hydrogen demand. This looks at the most recent uh, different scenarios. This is low carbon hydrogen. So this combines blue and green. As you can see, in all of these major scenarios, there is a significant increase in hydrogen demand, some more steep than others. At the same time, we see a projected global gas demand uh, to decrease. Uh, this is obviously to be looked at in context when comparing to coal or oil, the decrease is not as um, drastic, uh, but there is a decrease nonetheless. And there is between those two graphs uh, some overlap because, uh, for example, in, in the IEA um, SDS scenario, approximately half of the low carbon hydrogen demand will be met through natural gas. So natural gas is a competitor in the short term, uh, but also a benefit, uh, also a beneficiary of low carbon hydrogen demand. So it, it's there's so many different uh, considerations, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned. But this is just to give a high level view of of where the trends are going. 
So just to give a summary of where LNG can play a role, there's roughly uh, three different ways natural gas could play a role, sorry. One is to deliver LNG as is, and then uh, at the receiving terminal, uh, capture carbon, uh, uh, apply carbon capture, and then in, in, inject hydrogen into the grid. The other option is in the upstream side, to convert the upstream gas from hydrogen to ammonia, which allows it uh, to be shipped in an easier way, then reconvert ammonia back to hydrogen or use ammonia directly in, for example, coal fire power stations and so on, as we've seen in Japan recently. And the third option is to completely convert the upstream gas into liquid hydrogen and ship the liquid hydrogen, which re requires some economic and uh, technical advancements. But roughly there are three ways where um, gas can play a role. There is of course pyrolysis, which is another technology, but roughly it's, it's how do you deliver that gas uh, and then applying, instead of methane reforming, you would use pyrolysis, for example. So why, why, why were you looking at those two besides the overall demand and the importance? Well, there's actually also some, some, some links between those two that, uh, that should be investigated a bit more. From uh, obviously a feedstock natural gas, I mean, as the fastest growing segment within natural gas, LNG will, will, play, will play a role. I mean, if there is a place for quote unquote blue hydrogen, LNG obviously will, will play the, the key role there to deliver that. There are less and less pipeline gas projects and, and there's less indigenous supply, especially in Europe, for example. Therefore, if there is a role for blue hydrogen, LNG will, will meet that. The LNG industry is forecasted to have a positive uh, future in the next 10, 15 years, as we mentioned. So how does that fit in with hydrogen? But also uh, in terms of flexibility, uh, there's a lot of operational flexibility LNG that can in some ways meet some of those kind of uh, um, short term to medium term challenges where such so as floating regasification, being able to, to bring uh, LNG or gas quickly to markets in different places uh, to even extract markets in places where it was not uh, extracted uh, potentially commercially viable before. So that gives you opportunities there. From a technical operational synergies also, there are a few areas that are starting to be looked at. I mean, liquefaction, uh, if we were talking about liquefying hydrogen, liquefying, I mean, they're liquefying LNG, they're very different in terms of the temperature needed, but uh, there are some synergies potentially in, in some of the technology in the upstream there that can be looked at. Uh, there are ways where some of those characteristics, uh, those, those kind of um, uh, cry um, technologies behind cry cryogenic liquids and so on can be applied, and there are some studies behind that. But also uh, in terms of downstream, uh, you know, uh, use, utilizing natural gas and, and introducing low carbon hydrogen to those grids is a possibility and in some, some places it's already being done. It could be up to 10, 20% of the, of, the, of the current gas grid can take in low carbon hydrogen, which allows for um, synergies there. Uh, in terms of commercial synergies, probably even more, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, of the, the shipping side, although there, there were some initial uh, views on, on utilizing, on reconverting LNG ships to hydrogen ships, but it seems to be unlikely. But however, of course, um, using LNG as a feedstock um, will help the LNG industry, shipping industry a bit more. But from a value chain component, the way LNG was developed 30, 40 years ago and still being developed, there are lots of similarities for hydrogen potentially. Uh, you need long-term buyers. They're the same as we heard before, the same uh, importers previously could probably be the same importers uh, for LNG will be the same importers for hydrogen. Uh, you need a very complex chain uh, with project financing from the upstream all the way to the downstream, uh, assuming there is a level of uh, exports and imports are being developed. You will need some potential government to government agreements, which we've already seen, some bilateral agreements, some infrastructure development and transport, all that has been something where the hydrogen industry can learn from the LNG industry. And of course, long-term contracts, you know, um, these, these, these large projects will need to be underpinned initially as technology improves and as a shorter term market develops. So there are a lot of uh, potential uh, vertically integrated kind of uh, approaches that can be uh, applied uh, from one industry to another. And really a lot of the same players, whether it's energy companies or the technology providers, our, our, our companies are looking to uh, transfer some of that large project management experience or large kind of capital intensive technologies from one to the other. Now for LNG, um, hydrogen is also very important because if you look at the, the value chain of LNG, uh, there's obviously a lot of efforts to decarbonize the value chain uh, as much as possible to reduce the, the methane and the carbon 
kind of uh, intensity or carbon uh, emissions of, of the of the entire chain. The chain obviously starts from the production all the way to the delivery. Uh, and we've seen efforts such as carbon neutral cargoes. We've seen efforts being pushed by the EU with the methane strategy. We've seen producers like QP uh, announcing carbon capture to be installed in the upstream and the cofaction. Uh, we've also seen producers saying uh, um, adding electrification as much as possible using solar energy, for example, to uh, to run these plants as much as possible. And all of that will have a huge impact on the emissions. But at the end of the day, uh, over 70 to 75 percent, depending on the carbon intensity of the source of the emissions is downstream, meaning, it, for example, the power plant. And, and to do that long term, uh, importers and exporters will have to uh, look at different measures and hydrogen provides that uh, opportunity, blue hydrogen specifically, or natural gas based hydrogen provides that opportunity where you could actually decarbonize the entire uh, chain uh, if, if the conditions uh, make sense. And if you look at all the decarbonization options that LNG producers have, these are all things that are being looked at, uh, that are already announced or being implemented. And it obviously depends on project to project in terms of the, the, the geographical components or the, you know, the resources available. But these are all things that are being done. However, if you look at a more strategic or, or hydrogen related ones, these are the ones where the LNG exporters long term uh, and LNG importers will start to think about, OK, well, we can decarbonize and lower emissions as much as possible. If we want to truly decarbonize. We may want to look at these these options, which is uh, on, on on the on the importing end, which is uh, applying methane reforming or paralysis, then blending the hydrogen to the grid or straight into the grid or straight to industrial users and clusters, which we've seen as a potential first uh, wave of, of of opportunities, and that could be a great opportunity for LNG LNG industry to kind of deliver high value uh, low carbon hydrogen first, and and then be part of that transition. And also more strategically long term, if you're a resource holder, but all uh, and also you have access to uh, large or you have access to large scale renewables, you could think about producing hydrogen on the upstream. Uh, we mentioned blue here, but there's no reason why it can't also be green or both, depending uh, on the characteristics. But uh, these are these are these are this is where hydrogen really really also uh, factors in. That as we meant, previous speaker mentioned, eventually. Yes, blue hydrogen might be cheaper now. Eventually, it will be green only. What does that mean? Is there a role there? Um, and what do you do in the meantime? So these are just, this is an example of, of, of some research that we've done. Uh, it's just illustrative here to show you that the, the hydrogen economy, hydrogen value chain will be very complex and will develop in many different ways. And there are different options, uh, considerations from reduction technology to production location to the type of transport. I mean, we talked about um, here uh, liquid hydrogen, ammonia, you know, different derivatives or using LNG to then convert it. There's also uh, strategic considerations about uh, being an importer versus an export uh, versus continuing to uh, try to produce domestically. And there's also um, in terms of the role it plays in the economy, if you're looking to be a hydrogen economy, for example, in like Japan, or are you looking to use hydrogen to decarbonize hard to abate sectors? All those choices, uh, if you look at it from LNG exporter standpoint, have different uh, impacts and different uh, implications, short term and long term. Uh, and this is how uh, we're trying to analyze. And uh, to summarize this in a different way, this is a graphical representation of the LNG chain. And you, you look at it two different pathways, which is basically the, the blue hydrogen pathway. And, and if that is a pathway that makes sense in some regions, at least in the short to medium term, as you can see, there's high opportunity for LNG value chain to continue to operate or to have minor, uh, some modifications, but to be a major player. Um, the challenge will be in your gasification where you'll need to have uh, ability to, to manage your, your CO2 content either at the receiving terminal or close to it, it needs to be economically viable. Um, and then, um, but something that's interesting to, to note here now is, for example, um, gray hydrogen, which is, the, you know, non-blue, which is, is, you know, high, high CO2 emitting uh, hydrogen is now almost very close to blue hydrogen. If you look at even today's CO2 prices in Europe, I think that gap is closing very quickly. But that gap can also close with green hydrogen uh, even even quicker as we go forward. And if that was to develop, uh, as you can see, uh, if it's green only, for example, 
uh, your your options for energy exports are really minimal. Uh, you may be able to retrofit some of the facility, and your upstream gas obviously will have less value. So as you can see, the, the implications are significant. Uh, this is just illustrative, but this is significant for for different pathways. Um, this is something also we, we we covered in the previous presentation. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but uh, natural gas based technologies such as natural gas reforming and process will have to compete against electrolysis. Uh, and we saw that this is a, a curve from the IAE. The previous speaker summarized this very well. And the degree of of course will depend on many things. Technology will be a big thing, economies of scale and the production side, but also policy choices, um, CO2 prices, uh, potentially also more of a dogmatic choice, as you can say. Some some regions will say, no, we want green only, no matter what. All those things will, will impact short to medium term. Uh, natural gas based technology, though, taking all considered and looking at the big picture, is most economical choice for short to medium term. And to most most uh, uh, studies say 2030, 2035, depending on the region. Long term, it could become competitive uh, if uh, renewable energy based uh, electrolysis costs come down. Uh, and but also you could have to just factor in the cost of natural gas, and that will depend on the region. Amongst all the technologies, uh, natural gas based and CCUS can be supplanted by methane paralysis, which is an interesting one because that that is technology that is being looked at more and more, and basically that eliminates the need to have to manage the CO2. It gives you solid carbon, which is an easier product to manage. It's 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 a store. Um, this is could be could be a game changer for the um, you know quote unquote uh, blue hydrogen or natural gas based hydrogen, but that's a lot of uncertainty there. It's also quite um, energy intensive to produce uh, to to utilize the paralysis, but there are quite a few uh, invested investments going into it, and uh, it's something to keep an eye on. Paralysis could have a big potential, as I mentioned. If it if it, it, it could be a game changer, but this is something for now. I think. To, to just think about more, as I mentioned. Uh, Ill carbon hydrogen has potential to become a significant consumer, user of natural gas by, from now to 2040, depending on uh, measures taken and depending on LNG uh, players being proactive potentially. Depending on how low carbon hydrogen supply technology mix and associated market develops, there are different but significant implications in the industry as we saw. If low carbon production is mostly met with natural gas based, um, this could actually help a lot in, from a natural gas producing standpoint in extending the bridge. Uh, it could also slow down the decline in natural gas consumption. It could be seen as a uh, not just better than coal, but also part of a deep decarbonization pathway uh, tool, uh, which could be uh, beneficial for the industry. If, of course, not renewable based technologies become more prominent, natural gas consumption will be affected, and energy industry will be affected. This is quite logical. Uh, and to finalize, I think the energy industry is, however, well positioned to take advantage of natural gas based low carbon hydrogen demand. There, are, there is know how, there is expertise, and in many cases, the economics make sense. Uh, it's just a question of uh, how, how, how fast technology moves and how policy develops. Um, the hydrogen value chain and whether hydrogen is an opportunity or threat LNG will develop over the next decade. It's both. It's an opportunity. It's a threat uh, and depends on so many factors, but uh, there is definitely uh, some synergies there. And uh, just to close out, it's a paper uh, that I'm co-authoring and leading uh, on taking some of these concepts, but also modeling uh, different hydrogen scenarios and seeing how that impacts the LNG industry and to see where the the technical and the commercial impacts are uh, on a techno-economic basis. So thank you very much. That's my presentation for now.